This is the new CISO, a virtual mentorship podcast featuring candid conversations with the world's top cybersecurity leaders. Our guests go beyond standard security topics to reveal their journey into leadership and relay practical guidance, advice, and lessons learned along the way. I'm Steve Moore, Chief Security Strategist at Exabeam and host of the new CISO podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Michael Meese, Associate CISO at the University of Kansas Health System, and Mark Weatherford, Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center. Everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, this is episode, somehow, 100 of the new CISO podcast. I'm joined by two friends and colleagues that I met via the show, and I'm proud that they're here today. Um, to celebrate 100, 100, almost said 100 years, it feels like 100 years, 100 episodes. Uh, <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark relates. Uh, but this is this is to talk about leadership and mentorship and coaching. And uh, so that's the topic of this. And also, as some of you will see uh, video. So this is a, another stretch for the show. So it'll be available via the podcast uh, through normal mediums, but also uh, video. So for those who don't know or don't recognize, uh, we have Michael and Mark have joined us. Uh, Michael, if you would first uh, reintroduce yourself. Uh, you've been on the show before, but for those that haven't listened, Michael, who are you? Yeah, sure. My name is Michael Meese. I'm the Associate Chief Information Security Officer for the University of Kansas Health System. Welcome again. And Mark? Uh, Mark Weatherford. I am the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center, among few other things, but that's my primary role right now. For those, I, I would recommend, if you're not familiar, to go back and listen, if you're so inclined. I know we have loyal listeners, uh, but if you're not familiar, to go back and listen uh, to each of the kind of the pre-podcast, one of the things I think that we do and hopefully do well is since none of us are necessarily famous, uh, we spend a fair amount of time on the history of the individual. And that's done for a couple of reasons. I think it's important to kind of talk about the origin story. And that allows you to explore mistakes and successes and things that we could have done better and, and surprises along the career, right? And if you if you just jump right into advice, it's a little harder to connect and sort of feel like you know this individual. And so um, it'll allow you maybe a little bit to know these guests slightly better because today we're going to jump right in uh, to that advice. I want to start, actually, if I could, um, and maybe maybe we start with Mark on this one. Um, can you share uh, the most interesting career opportunity you've been offered that you didn't take? There's there's more ch chances that this happens the longer we we go in our career, but decision making is so important. That's one of the number one topics that I engage in with CISOs and security leaders. Of so do I choose A or do I choose B? And, and maybe the next one is then when right? When's the right time? So uh, does anything fall into that category on that decision making and maybe a story around it of something that you've always wondered? Damn, should I have gone left or right or zigged or zag? Yeah, I mean, there have been a few of those, uh, not too many, probably two or three. I'm probably the most significant one was I was I was still on in the Navy, on active duty in the Navy, and uh, I was in Pensacola, Florida. I was leading. Um, I was the, basically the CIO of the Navy Technical Training Center in Pensacola. Um, so not only did I have all of the responsible for all the technology for a schoolhouse of 10,000 students. Uh, but I had division officer responsibilities. And it was a, it was a great job. I loved it. And, um, and I got a call literally out of the blue from my Navy detailer. He said, Hey, I'm sending you to Norfolk, Virginia. And, and, you know, I was flabbergasted because I really did not want to go. I mean, I fought tooth and nail, but um, the way the military works, I'd just been promoted and the Navy kind of owns you for a period of time after a promotion. So I really didn't have a choice. He said, you're, I need you in Norfolk. You're going to Norfolk, Virginia. And so I went to Norfolk and I became the operations officer for a brand new Navy cyber organization um 
we became the operational arm for cyber. This was like, well, this is in the late nineties. So there was no real organization or Navy doing what we were doing there. And I stood up the Navy's first red team operations. I ran what at the time was the NAV CERT, the Navy computer incident response team. And, um, it would, t I look back on it often. It literally changed my life, changed my career. Um, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, but I'm telling you, they took me up there kicking and screaming and, you know, my feet were planted in Florida and I did not want to go. And, uh, but it ended up being a good thing for me. Why did you just really like Florida or was there something with that mission down there that you connected with like that? Unpack that a little bit. I think the, what was your mindset? You get that call and what what went into that? I think this this happens, whether it's military or not, this happens with a lot of us where we, oh God, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Well, I would say, you know, in retrospect, I was comfortable. I had a job. I understood it. Um, you, you know, uh, it, I kind of had a, a strategy for where I was taking the organization. Um, and this kind of came out of the blue. I mean, I was, uh, I was about a year and a half into what was typically a three-year job. Again, in retrospect, there were a couple of my um, uh, senior leaders, some of my mentors were engineering this in the background for me to take this job because they knew that it would be good for me. Uh, they knew that I was the right guy for the job. Um, so, and, you know, even as I'm trying to talk them out of it, I could just see it in their eyes, no, that you're, you're doing this because it's the right thing for you and it's the right thing for the Navy. Well, the best part of that is that's the other tricky part of life sometimes is and this happens uh, certainly in the civilian world and and both of you can represent it in the military. But in general, there are times where there's this hand of God who might actually be trying to help you in behind the scenes. And you're just so smart, you don't even see it or feel it. And and so Mark is ready to be in Florida for the rest of the, you know, the year. He wants another 18 months and he's got his hands like this and saying, no, I don't want, I don't want this thing. Right. And they've put, burned their political capital and thinking in the background to, to grease the skids to make this. Ha right. So that's a fascinating reflection, uh, on that moment in time. We talked about this previously, I think, you know, when I was the CISO at NER, um, and I get the call from Howard Schmidt at the White House said, hey, we want you to come and be the, you know, deputy undersecretary for cybersecurity. And I said, Howard, I do not want to go back into government. And, you know, he said, no, I'm, I'm nominating you. You know, you're the guy we want. And and again, I kind of thought it a little bit, but I, I, you know, I went and I talked to a bunch of my friends. I said, what do you think? You know, should I do this or not? You know, it, it was a huge pay cut. It was in Washington, D.C. It was like all of the things that, you know, that could be considered negative were there. Um, but it was, you know, it, it once again ended up being a really good job. I mean, I was really able to have some influence over national cyber policy. Um, so it, it, and but I just still remember, you know, Howard Smith, God rest his soul, um, called me and and. Um, and said, you're the guy. I'm like, Howard, please don't do this to me. Michael, do you have any, uh, 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 a similar set of experiences or a, a story that kind of goes along with that? And it, you know, you and I've had a chance to talk about career a couple of times and, and those are some of my favorite conversations again, getting back into, uh, decision-making and tying that to what's your mental mission, what's your commitment. Um, how do you sort of make a change and how do you go where maybe the, the key for me is Mark says he was comfortable. And that's always a thing then for me, um, that I've had to remind myself in the back of my mind is, you know, dad always used to tell me, he said, if you feel uncomfortable, that's probably the right thing, the right path to go down. If it makes you uncomfortable, right. So you and I've talked a bit about that. So, uh, what's your take on this point? What's a story you can share for the, the virtual mentorship for Michael? Yeah, similar similar to Mark, um, it, but kind of on the flip side of it. When I was in the army, I actually turned down a promotion multiple times uh, because I 
I didn't want them to have control over where, what I was doing. I, I kind of decided early in my career about maybe two or three years into the army, that it was a great experience, but that I was not going to be a lifer. I, I was not going to be, you know, somebody put in my 20, um, I, um, there's kind of pieces of my personality that weren't very compatible with the way the army, uh, approaches things in the military in general. And so I knew, I knew that I wanted to take, take what it was for the experience that it was, uh, for the relationships I had made for the value I could get out of it, but that I wanted control over where I was going to head next. Um, and so when I, my, I had my company kind of putting in my promotion packet, uh, several times without even talking to me about it. And so I would just get these letters that I was eligible for a promotion and I would have to decline it because I knew what came with that, uh, that, you know, they, they do get, they get very heavy say over what happens to you next. And I didn't want to give that up. Um, and so I, I think about that quite a bit because I think it, you know, kind of, once you start down that path, um, it's very easy to just kind of stay in for 10, 15, 20 years. And because I, I, I kind of took that stance very early on, um, to the chagrin of a lot of my leadership. I've uh, been really focused on how do I get onto a path that I want to do on the civilian side um, and and not as a, a, a member of the military um, and really focused on how do I build that skill set? How do I build the relationships to be able to launch that career, et cetera, while still using the value that I got from the military? For example, I had a security clearance and so government work makes a lot of sense, but on the civilian side. Um, and so that, that was something that I, I decided really early on and then prioritized several times, uh, over the preceding year or two where it kind of came into conflict with, uh, what, what they wanted out of me. It's an interesting thing to, to have to sort of go or to, to, to know yourself enough. And I feel like that's an ever changing target. Maybe someday we finally figure it out, but what are the things that we really, what do we represent? What do we want out of life? What do we think we want, right? And what's being offered? And um, it's not my my episode, uh, but I can I think back to a time when I was offered a position that I was completely not qualified for. Not only was I not qualified for it, um, people would spend their entire life to get this type of position. And I said no, and they came back again. I said no again, and, I, and I, nothing ever went beyond that. Um. But it sounds like such of a wild situation that people don't even believe. I kept the letters so people would believe me. But the the reason why I share it today, and I've mentioned it before, is because I knew the lifestyle wasn't for me. It wasn't a matter of, well, this is uncomfortable and I can, I'm going to stretch and grow and I'm afraid and can I do it? It was none of that. It was um, people that take these roles typically have a very tough home life and uh, their longevity is often affected. And even though they make a ton of money, it's not the lifestyle I want. And that was a very hard thing because it's would some would measure it as moderately prestigious. So I share that is so how, so I pose the question back to both of you. What is this journey? How do you take into, how do you measure where you want to take your day and take your career? And, um, is that changing or is that pretty well fixed? And what advice do you have to others that are trying to do the same? Like, gosh, what, this looks like a great job, but it might ruin my, my home life. You know, this is those sorts of things. Do you have any advice there? Any examples that's sort of the, the benchmark of knowing who you are versus what's being offered? Yeah, I think for me, I, I kind of work backwards from the things that, um, fulfill me. Um, what's, what's most important to me or when do I feel at my best versus at my worst? And so kind of going back to that decision around the army is, I value my autonomy. Um, I like to be able to make decisions uh, and not have my decision power taken away. Um, I tend to be uh, kind of obstinate and when I feel like my decision power has been taken away and anyone who has spent any time around the military will realize you have no decision power uh, when you're in the military. And so it was just kind of working backwards from here that, you know, that, that was something that was very core to to what fulfilled me and what made me um, happy. And I would only have kind of a limited amount of it ever in that role. Um, I would say though, to your other question is that that kind of evolves over time. I mean, I was 
19 years old when I joined. So I kind of grew up and it changes as you're growing up. And it changed again when I uh, got married and changed again when I had a kid and then changed again when I had another kid. It changes when you start making more money versus, you know, just trying to pay bills. Um, and so it, it is a continuous process where I think you have to periodically reevaluate what fulfills you and where do you feel happy and uh, what are what are your priorities uh, and then kind of work backwards from there of, of how do you get there and um, how does that role or whatever potential role you're looking at support the things that you value and prioritize. Listen, I've been very fortunate. I, you know, very, very fortunate, more fortunate than than I have any right to that I've had some pretty amazing jobs um but as we talked about in our in our earlier thing you know most people think of me as a pretty laid back guy and I am but I also am very internally competitive and I always want to be number one um and so I decided in it this I can remember this really early in my Navy career like like Michael you know I was a young petty officer in the Navy uh, before I got commissioned. And I always wanted to be the guy who got the call. I wanted to be the guy who they said, hey, call Weatherford. You know, he can do this. And so that's kind of been the the mantra throughout my career is I wanted to be that person. Now, where I say I've been fortunate is every job that I've taken, I felt like I had the the flexibility to grow, uh, but much like you in every one of, I can't, I literally cannot think of a job that I've taken, um, post Navy where I didn't feel like, Holy crap, I am so far over my head here. Um, you know, everyone's going to realize that I'm a fraud, you know, the imposter syndrome, you know, maybe I'm too dumb to know better, but I just worked my way, worked hard and worked my way through it and figured it out. Um, and, you know, and, you know, I think another really, you know, a good leadership trait is, man, I surrounded, I, I never thought I was the smartest person in the room. Um, in fact, you know, you talk to any people, anybody that's ever worked with me or for me, and they'll say, he probably wasn't the smartest person in the room. But I surrounded myself with people. I mean, you know, I surrounded myself with people who could play to my weaknesses, you know, and, and. I have never, I was never, ever um, looking to be the guy who got all the glory. I can remember, you know, having young seamen, the young petty officers when I was in the Navy and even post Navy, I don't mean to talk all about my Navy career, but, but, you know, um, young engineers on my team who I would kind of elevate. I used to bring these guys into board meetings with me and say, Hey, this guy's going to brief, going to brief on this, this issue today. Um, you know, and one, it gives them some visibility, but it also, it, I think it showed the, you know, the organization that I was really dependent upon the organization. If I may interject, and I think that's something that's probably, it's getting better, I feel like, but it's still not good enough. And exposure, especially in our profession, bringing in a junior level person or even a mid-level person or really any level to, to say, hey, here's some of these meetings and here's the kind of questions that we receive and here's the reason why I bring maybe things make more sense when I come back from these meetings and I have to say, hey, can we can we do an analysis on this or can we sharpen up the numbers around that or can we whatever, right? If you're in the room and hearing these questions, um, that prepares you. Uh, you know, I don't know that I have any famous quotes, but um one of my one of the ones I think I enjoy the most from my experiences is never make an introduction in a crisis. And if you are good at what you're talking about there, bringing in guests, bringing in junior level folks, when there is a crisis, everyone's going to be just that much more familiar with you and your program, and they can represent and communicate. It's not strangers, and that's really important. Um, I, I I will I will I will die on that bill. You know, I'm on the advisory board for a uh, for a large oil company, and um, and we have quarterly meetings. And the CISO every meeting, he brings in two or three of the people on his team to brief on very specific things. And to me, it 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 it's good because it it gives obviously gives them exposure, but it also goes to show that hey, you know, I need 
these guys, I can't do everything. I need my team to be here and be part of this. And um, I I know that every every other I'm the only um, the only non um, uh, member of the company who's on this advisory board. The rest of them are all presidents of business units, and I know they appreciate seeing all of these people come in and realize the diversity of talent that it takes to run a security organization like well, that, and the ability then to go in and for that junior level person to, to build the confidence around preparing and the mental gymnastics and, oh, you've got 12 minutes to present. No, you've got two. So tighten it up even more, get that experience. So their first day when they're elevated, isn't their first day. They've done it before. I mean, you're doing, there's so many elements of, of goodness that happen. Uh, Michael, any other points on that? Any thoughts that you'd add? Yeah, I think it's, it's something that our industry still struggles with. Um, I think we've been fighting for so long to get visibility into cybersecurity. We forget that it's more than just visibility for the CISO. Um, and so it, it is good to see um, making more progress because I agree, getting exposure to those types of situations is so important for the career development of the, the people in the organization, aside from um, what Mark talked about of getting that visibility so they understand it's not just you it's a team of people behind you but then even from a succession planning perspective is i mean we all know what the job tenure of CISOs is out there right now uh, and so if you're not actively developing your replacement you're failing your organization and part of that is taking some of the glamour off of reporting to the board if they've never reported to a board before take them to a meeting uh let them listen in uh let them brief on a specific topic but um kind of taking some of that uh, mount olympus type shine off of uh, being able to report to a board uh, helps it so that when they do have to go sit in that seat, to your point, Steve, it's not their first time. They've seen it happen before. They've been a part of it and it, it it's a much more natural transition. And so ultimately the organization is in a better place when you ultimately do depart. I'd add to that. So not only board, but then also uh, sometimes an SLT or ELT meeting can be even sporty or the board meeting. Like you can have, there's a different there's a different vibe um, and different types of rudeness that can happen. Uh, and while they all can be direct, I've seen a lot more um, strange behavior in the SLT ELT than I have in the board. Uh, high expectations in both, but very different personalities tend to emerge uh, in each. So yeah, all goodness there. I want to switch to something a little bit, well, by nature, analog. Uh, or could be. Um, I get this question a fair amount, and I know you have a perspective on it, uh, just on leadership um, books in general. There's obviously many to choose from. We won't go through a large list, but if you were to add, let's say, a new director or maybe even meet a, a, a peer at an event and you're sharing, say, hey, what's the best book you've, you've uh, read in the last year? Um, or, or what's your favorite in general? Michael, what would you advise? Yeah, so my go-to on leadership is extreme ownership. I, I, I'll pick a new one since I talked about that during my last uh, appearance on here as well, but uh, I have to plug it. I, I think every leader needs to read uh, the book Extreme Ownership, but um, especially for uh, new leaders or leaders coming into an organization, uh, the first 90 days, I think is uh, absolutely indispensable advice. Um, I, I think that Oftentimes we we underestimate um, how that first few months will impact the trajectory of everything else we do at the organization. Uh, getting there, getting started quickly, building relationships quickly, building credibility quickly, and having a plan right out of the gate. Um, you often see leaders kind of come in and, and um, for lack of a better way of putting it, kind of sit around for a couple of months. You know, they, they call it getting the lay of the land or whatever. And I, I think you're wasting a valuable opportunity. Uh, so I always encourage everyone to, to read that book because it gives a lot of very actionable guidance on how to get started quickly. And um, I've seen people that have dug a hole in their first 90 days that they never dug out of uh, for several years and then vice versa, people who got off to a fast start and so even when they did trip a couple months down the road um, or had a failure, they kind of already that credibility momentum that allowed, allowed them to just power right through it. 
I'll second that. The first 90 days is a great um, book. I don't know if they've made like a security version of it, but it's pretty easy to sort of just take it and imagine what you might need to do. Uh, but I, I think that's a, a very good recommendation. But Extreme Ownership uh, is is fantastic. I I very much enjoy that. Um, I like, I'm a big fan of Jocko. Uh, and it's, I think it, in the line of work that we're in, uh, I think it's a, a good, a good analog for us. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Mark, what do you, what gems do you have for us? What do you enjoy? What do you recommend? Yeah. I, you know, I've read so many leadership books over the years. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, this is going to sound cliche as hell, but I still like Sun Tzu. Um, you know, there's so many little nuggets in there in the art of war that are directly applicable to what we do in our business. But I, I think, you know, another one that I stumbled across, actually, I, I brought this guy in as, in as a guest speaker um, when I was CISO for the state of California. Uh, his name's Michael Abershaw. He was the he was the commanding officer, going back to my Navy stuff again, but he was a commanding officer of a destroyer. And when he took over um, this destroyer, they were they were failing at everything. They were, they were just, it was a bad ship. And, you know, anybody who's been in the Navy and been on ships, you know, certain commands get a bad reputation. And it just kind of starts a death spiral um, in many ways. But so Abershoff takes over the ship. And he completely turns it around in, in like two years and he makes them the top of, of every category that they, that a Navy ship would be judged on. And so the book, I'm sorry, the book is titled It's Your Ship um, by Michael Abshaw. And he just goes through how he basically, you know, he would give a very junior person the opportunity that says, hey, I have a better, I think I have a better way of doing something. And they could go to the skipper and say, Hey, can we, I think I have an idea here. Can we, can we try something? And, you know, it kind of gave everyone in the, on the ship, the, the ability to say the, the ability to influence that how things were going on the ship. And it kind of took them out of the doldrums of, of, you know, kind of, this is the way we do it, uh, to everybody going, holy crap, you know, I can actually influence this, you know, the, this ship and, the book, he just kind of walks through everything he did um, to to change the culture on that ship. And it's it was pretty amazing. It's a pretty amazing book. Yeah. I mean, I know it was a good opportunity for you to brag about all the leadership books you've read. And and we, but I'm, I, I'm teasing. I, I appreciate, I've never heard of that Abershoff. I'm hopefully I'm saying it correctly, but it's your ship. I will make note of that. And I'm actually going to make sure I buy that book. I, I love that. Um, it, it sounds great. And I'm curious to see what else he did. Of how do you take, and I don't know the ins and outs of, of managing a ship, but uh, certainly have had taken, been given teams that were uh, failing and arguably measurably a disaster. Uh, that's part of often what we get in our career when we're uh, a, a, new, a new leader. Either you're for most of my early career, mid career was here's something that's an absolute dumpster fire. Um, and we're going to give it to Steve because he's got a high pain tolerance and we're going to go. And then later on, mid level to, to more senior was, okay, let's try to build something. Let's use Steve to build something that's maybe unique or will distinguish us, uh, from our industry peers. If that's sort of a mission or goal, right. To say, how do we, so they're very different situations, but I love the fact more often than not, you'll get the dumpster fire, especially if you're junior or mid. Sometimes you're going to get both. Build something amazing, and here's the dumpster fire, right? So it's a, um, it's very good. It sounds like sometimes you, sometimes you accept the dumpster fire. You know, you know, going into a job that hey, I, I'm taking this. No one else may realize it, but I realize. It. Well, here, okay. So this, the one of the themes, and I, this isn't doing the book justice because we all need to go. I need to read it and others maybe as well. But it sounds like this gets maybe a little bit into sort of the esprit de corps, right? To have, how do I, what, and we go into, into jobs, whether it's military or, or civilian side, where there is, I don't know, maybe it's been bad leadership in the past. Maybe the mission isn't correct. Uh, maybe it's 
been defined poorly. Maybe they're not enabled. Um, you know, maybe there's high repetition and there's not a lot of development, whatever these things might be. Um, how do we, or how do, well, this is about you, how do each of you, uh, go in and sort of assess that? I know it's a, a pretty wide, uh, scope there, but when you take over a new post or become, uh, a, a, a new director of, or CISO, what are the first couple things that you, that you want to, uh, assess as it relates to kind of the, the, the strength of the team, uh, as, as a, in terms of their alignment to mission and, and their, their spirit, uh, Michael. Yeah. So I start by first understanding the people, uh, that make up the organization. Uh, it really helps determine kind of the tempo that I'm going to take going forward. Uh, do you have strong people that maybe haven't had good leadership uh, or don't understand the vision or are poorly connected or is it a total overhaul and there's just no talent there uh, and you kind of need to go scorched earth. And so it, it really helps to inform the rest of the approach is first understanding the people that you've got to work with because whatever else you come up with doesn't work unless you solve the people equation first. So um, generally I have a, a ton of meetings with uh, the people that are going to be uh, within my organization. It, depending on the size of the org, those will be something as as uh, involved as a one-on-one -on -one with every single member of the team or in larger teams, maybe putting them into functional groups and kind of meeting with them that way. But the, the core approach is the same as get an understanding of the talent that you've got at your disposal and then understand what are, what is the success criteria for whatever you're trying to meet, whether that's, uh, leading a destroyer or leading a security team. What does success look like? And then work backwards from there. Why are we, why are we not meeting success criteria today? Uh, what will need to change in order to get there? And you just work backwards from that success criteria. Uh, and so the, the length of time depends obviously on how many resources you have available, what people you have available to you, et cetera. But I always firmly believe in starting with an objective and then working backwards. And then getting them aligned to what that objective is, why we're trying to get there and how we're going to get there and get everybody bought into that mission. It's really amazing what people could do when they get bought into that concept of we're going somewhere. It's important uh, and that we are going to do it together. People can really kind of start to move mountains uh, to use a cliche, but uh, really, really impressive the way people buy into that type of an approach. I agree with Michael, you know. People, people, people. Understanding the culture, oftentimes, you know, you go in and it's a bad culture. And then you've got to figure out, okay, where are my leaders? Where are my bright spots? And, you know, how can I start carving out the rock? But on the, uh, on the, the other hand, sometimes you are entering a dumpster fire and you really don't have time to do this you know, broad 90 day assessment, you're like on day one, you're, you're starting to fix things. You know, those are obviously the worst case scenarios, but you know, I've done it twice and it's, it's, it's no fun, but I will tell you at this, it, while, while you get to, you know, kind of showcase your, um, your talent in a, an experience like that, you also get to see the talent of the people in the organization. You know, who wants to step up, um, who wants to be part of the solution? Um, but it, it really, it really, I mean, I, I can't say it any better than Michael did. You know, you, you've got to look at the culture, look at the people and figure out, you know, what's worth saving or what's not worth saving. You know what I mean? You know, that's a harsh thing to say, but in many cases, there are people that simply are not worth saving. Um, and, 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 and the worst part of the, and the, the extreme case of that, you've got toxic personalities that are actually, you know, driving the organization in the wrong direction. And you really got to find those quickly and get rid of that. Well, and Mark, you make an interesting point too, because, um, oftentimes you don't have this long runway in, in order for you to start making improvements. And so you can kind of start making changes and then using those changes to inform what you would have found out if you had time to spend those. Like uh, when I was at H and R Block, um, I walked into a, a team that um, needed needed to be improved, 
and uh, and we needed to make improvements pretty quickly. And I, I identified pretty much on my first day uh, that there was this very hierarchical structure uh, between the people who had been there a while and the people who were relatively new and were bringing fresh ideas. And one of the ways that you could kind of distinguish who was one of those individuals was they would have a, a email signature with all kinds of letters after their name, all, every certification that they had gotten throughout their career. And it became this like super long list on their email signature. And so one of the very first changes I made is I said, we're going to standardize email signatures, get rid of all the letters. Everyone has the exact same email signature. And uh, there were certain people who threw a huge fit about it. Why do I have to change my email signature? You're being a micromanager, things like that. And it, it almost gave me immediate insight into who was going to be resistant to change and who is not going to, because other people were like, yeah, sure, that's fine. Whatever you want the email signature to be. And so such a small change gives me, gave me almost immediate insight into who I was probably going to have issues with and who I wasn't and who was going to buy into what we were trying to do. One of the funny things you mentioned, sometimes you're just given a dumpster fire or given a crisis. And I personally, I don't think I'm an, adre an, an uh, adrenaline junkie, but it kind of may sound like it by the way I say this, but the beauty of a crisis is people have the ability to add value right away because in a crisis it's a different operating model especially doing incident response breach response these sorts of things you either add value or you don't you can either you and you know level and grade and politics all that goes to the side either you're adding value to help be the part of the solution or you're not and so when it comes time to ask for help to say hey i need something i need this or Conversely, you'll have people that come to you. What do you need, Steve? What do you need? Hey, I work way over here, but what do you need? And it's interesting the personalities some people sort of run into to help and others take a half step back and say, uh -uh -uh, I don't want my name on this damn thing. And so that to me, the benefit as a new leader, if you go in and volunteer for a crisis, either at a new opportunity or maybe in your existing company, you can learn. You're learning in dog year, just ripping through, okay, who can I trust? Who wants to work? Who wants to get at it? Who can execute? It's really kind of a, a strange but beautiful moment. And so I share that here to the podcast as a point of reflection when looking at new opportunities, but also as a point for to hear your perspectives, both Michael and Mark, on this, because I think it's there's some beauty in crisis and taking over to say, Mark, we need you to lead this problem. We need, we, we need you to lead us out of this issue. And you get to pick, there's some gems that rise to the surface that you might not have otherwise found. Maybe you would have found it, but it might have taken some time. Or maybe it's a new interaction. I don't know. I probably belabored it a little much, but I, I, that's one thing that I've really learned. Look for those people that step forward because I've really bonded with those folks for years afterwards. I'll, I'll never forget sort of like, hey, I want to help you in a crisis. Uh, Mark, thoughts on that just in just general from a leadership perspective? Well, I can give you a really great example. Um, when I was uh, at DHS in 2012, you may remember, probably don't remember, but the finance industry in America, and the United States came under attack from the Iranian Izar al Qazam, I, what, I, the, the freedom fighters in, in, in Iran. And, uh, and we had to, we at DHS, we had to bring together all of the intelligence community, all of the law enforcement, all of the organization within the federal government and say, how do, I, I don't know if you remember, remember but it was like every week, Literally every seven days, they would announce, okay, on Tuesday at 10 a.m., we're going to DDoS this bank, this bank, and this bank. It went off for two or three weeks, and, and then we go, holy crap, we have to do something about this. So I reached down. I Actually, I didn't reach down. W one of the people, uh, I'm not going to say what his name, but he was like, he was, he was that guy that said, let me ha let me own this and and literally i mean i i i still we still stay in touch today he was a hero he brought together every organization in the federal government 
um, that, that could be of value to this. And we were meeting on a daily basis. He was like, he was like a, uh, uh, he was like a ship captain. He was going, okay, you've got this, you've got this, you've got this. And after like a week, I'm like, crap, I don't even need to be here anymore. But he owns it. He's got it. And literally, I, he just, I mean, he resolved this. We didn't resolve the issue, but we got in front of it where once, you know, we were able, we established, we DHS established very close and personal relationships with every bank in the, in America. Um, and when something would happen, boom, we were right on top of it. And, but that, that was an example of, of one of these people where the cream rises to the top. I mean, he just took ownership of it and, and, um, and we gave him all the credit in the world for it. And he's a CISO at a, at a big bank now and, and still a good friend of mine. Good for him and good for you. Uh, and, and that's awesome. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, a friend of mine that we've, we've been friends for several years and we both kind of came up through the incident response space and we always have a kind of a running joke that we're suckers for a burning building because it's, it's such a fantastic opportunity to be able to get involved in things that you otherwise wouldn't because there's all these hierarchical structures in an organization and whose approvals you need to get and what level you need to be to be at certain conversations. And then the organization gets proverbial punched in the mouth and um, all of a sudden they're just looking for answers and people care a whole lot less who brings those answers and who brings that value. I always thought incident response was such a beautiful um, show of that because it's nonstop problems that that's all instant response is is finding problems and dealing with them um, and so we had countless examples uh, throughout my career but uh, we had one individual that we hired on at the time he was a personal trainer um, and wanted to get into cybersecurity um, and uh, had no experience but just brought this this great attitude of, of problem solving wanted to get in wanted to get his hands dirty so we hired him as a junior analyst he just he worked his way up so quickly using that exact same approach that mark is talking about every time there was a problem it was him right there saying oh we could do this we could try this how, how can i help how can i add something to this and i think that not only was it useful for him but i think it's it's just an overall solid career advice is if you can find pain points if you can find problems and give Mark exactly what his individual did, where they realize they don't need to deal with it because you've got it. You've just taken something off the plate of somebody whose plate is too full and they will never, ever forget that. And so it just, it's career advice as much for anyone is if you could find something that is stressing someone out uh, high up in your organization and take it off their plate, uh, it just, that is the best career move you will ever make. Completely agree. Um, I also think what I was going to mention earlier and but from both the conversations is when you go in, find the people that have passion because uh, they're the ones that will work no matter what. They have passion for the if you, if, you, if you have it or you don't, right, for a set of tasks or a mission or whatever, where's passion? And then just excitement and enthusiasm, which the gentleman you just mentioned had. He's in, had no experience seemingly in the craft yet, but had great amount of enthusiasm to say, hey, here's um, and then I think as you go up, then, then look for problems to take, say, Hey, let me run with that boss. I got this. Um, so I think those three things kind of go together in a nice little sort of career guide or, 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 or playbook. I could talk about all of this all day long. We've gone about almost 50 minutes. I do want to close on maybe a, a, a less technical or a less career focused and maybe more individual focus. Um, I have a question on balance and one on um, fulfillment development. I guess what for both of you outside of the security space, maybe even outside the leadership space, what helps each of you stay grounded and maybe um, deal with some of the the, the stress uh, of this of this field? What would you recommend either that others do, or what do you do? Um, sort of a from a non security standpoint, is there another element of learning that you go look for? Is there a set of activities? that you do to kind of balance yourself out or is it kind of all down the same path? Maybe Mark. I'm not very good at this. Um, I, I'll admit I'm, um, you know, 
my wife uh, reminds me often when I'm taking a call on Sunday afternoons, like, why, why don't you have a regular job like normal people, you know, and work Monday through Friday? And so I think that kind of goes to what we were just talking about, this passion. People in our, in our business, we, we don't typically live by a nine to five clock. We, you know, we kind of respond to, um, to what's happened. Um, and you know, if we all know that five o'clock on Friday, when the phone rings, it's probably not good news. Um, so, so I would say I, I, I'm not very good at managing at, I, I feel like I, I'm good at managing stress because I'm just, I've done it for so long, but a life balance, I guess it, probably you'd get different answers if you asked my wife or you asked me, um, because I, it's normal for me to have a call on Sunday afternoon. Um, but you know what my non security thing, I think, you know, I, I have a small ranch here in Colorado. Um, and there are, there's always a million things to do on a ranch. Um, but one of the things I do, that's probably the most relaxing. I, I, I have beads. I keep honeybees and, um, it's, it, the, a very relaxing thing for me is to go and, you know, obviously you have to have a purpose, but go and open up the beehives. And when you can look in and see 40 or 50,000 bees all doing their thing, it's just, it's kind of Zen like almost. Um, and so that's, you know, that's one thing that I really enjoy. Would a, a younger version of Mark, would 20 year old Mark laugh at the fact that you, have, I think bees are amazing. And I love the fact that I love bees, uh, on many levels, but uh, would, would 20 year old Mark be surprised if you, if he learned that you have bees that, and you like enjoy the interaction? No, probably not. No, probably not. No, you know, it, it's just, I kind of have that background, but so I don't think it would be, I would, I, he would be surprised that it took me this <laughs> long to do it. That, that's good. That's good. No, I didn't know that about you. And thank you for sure. I love that. Uh, so do you have the full, you know, the outfit and all the rest, the, the, the little body suit? Yeah. Oh, of that's course. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Michael. Yeah. I, I think, uh, what Mark said it is a, is a great starting point is I, first of all, I encourage everybody to kind of get rid of the uh, a lot of the preconceived notions that we've developed from other career paths or other jobs, like that you're going to have a nine to five, um, it, it is understand the realities of the industry that you work in, um, uh, and make sure number one, that you even want to do that. Um, and, and accept that that's part that comes with the job and be okay with that and talk to your family about it, et cetera. We, we do tend to attract a lot of uh, personalities, just like Mark and myself, uh, where, you know, we don't know how to go halfway. Um, we're we're kind of all in. Uh, we're not the normal people, as our spouses would say. Uh, but then, and then also understand what balance means to you. Uh, because to me, and it sounds like to Mark, is balance to me is not 50-50. Uh, balance to me is go 100 and then take, take you know, a day or half a day and go do something interesting. Um, and so for me, I, I love to travel. My wife and I love to travel. We'll find uh, new fun places to go. Um, I try to build my team in such a way where a couple times a year, I can completely turn my phone off during those travels and know that, you know, the entire world is not going to melt down. And then I, I'm also an avid video gamer. So I use that as my kind of escape uh, mentally. Uh, when I got a lot going on, you know, an hour into a virtual world can do wonders uh, for how I'm feeling. And then on a more daily basis, I, I took up meditation uh, a couple years ago, maybe two or three years ago. And, you know, just 10, 15 minutes uh, in the morning to just kind of center myself sometimes at lunchtime. And uh, it does wonders to kind of compartmentalize whatever is going on, put it into perspective and really be able to regulate a lot of the physical manifestations of stress that will happen sometimes. So I think it'll look different to everybody, but just find something that works within the parameters of what you think is normal uh, and, and don't really worry about what everyone else thinks is normal. Thank you for sharing that. I, I uh, thank you for both of you for, for being on the show and for contributing not only to this show, but to others. Uh, thanks for the, 
the, the virtual coaching and mentorship that you've given. Uh, I am absolutely blessed to know you both. Uh, and this, this strange vehicle of this podcast is, is somehow brought us together. And, and I know everybody appreciates, uh, you know, hearing from you both. And, um, and I've gotten feedback, uh, that supports that. So thank you for helping us celebrate a hundred. I didn't think that it would happen. I wasn't sure, but uh, even more than that, it's a pleasure knowing you both. And uh, thank you for being a, a part of all of our lives. Thank you. That's it for this episode of the new CISO. Thank you for listening. Check out more episodes on exabeam.com forward slash podcast. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe to get brand new episodes first.